Okay. In a minute or two, we are starting, and uh, I hope if you are really determined, you could get your coffee or tea. Uh, somehow, in some way, uh, I consider that a problem solved. We are very happy and honored to have Professor Birchinger, a distinguished theoretical physicist from MIT. He is visiting uh, us this week to give lectures on this, our beloved uh, humanities course. Uh, he is giving two lectures. And uh, we asked him uh, uh, to give a public talk, and he generously uh, ex accepted it. And a uh, few words about him. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Caltech and then a PhD from Princeton. Later, uh, he got his tenure at MIT and became full professor and then became the chair of the department. And uh, so he chaired the department for six or seven years. And uh, now he's no longer chair, but uh, has a very important administrative post. Uh, he'll be helping MIT to achieve more just uh, representation in gender, in uh, minorities, which is, of course, a major problem. Uh, and uh, we are also proud that a physicist, even though it's a different continent, has been uh, uh, given this important uh, uh, duty. And this also tells us that physicists are not to be de depicted as uh, Dr. Strangelove, but uh, they can do these things. So uh, thank you for coming and uh, giving us this, uh, these uh, lectures. Professor Birchinger. Thank you very much, Professor Sevgen, and thank you all for coming. It's been a great honor and pleasure to come to Boazic University and to visit Istanbul to meet with the beautiful people, the students, a place of great history and moment. I very much enjoyed this, these several days with my wife, Tatiana. Uh, we love your, your cooking, the beautiful gardens. Uh, everything is so, so new and spectacular for us. Thank you very much for, for your hospitality in this visit and for coming. As Professor Sevgen said, I am a theoretical physicist, but also a person with a, a deep love of the universe, of ideas, and of people. And so in this afternoon's lecture, I will combine those themes into a story of the universe, the visible universe we see, and the invisible universe we do not. The image shown on the screen is one of the most beautiful images of the night sky that I've ever seen. A comet passed close to the sun at the end of 2006 and beginning of 2007. And when it did so, this dirty ball of snow, ice, and dust developed a long tail, tens of millions of miles long, stretching across the inner solar system and lighting up our night sky. This photograph was taken from the Andes Mountains of South America, and I saw the same view in Chile in South America at that time. It was astonishing to see in one's sight an object spanning our inner solar system, a distance of several hundred million kilometers from us, or eight light minutes, it took light from that comet, eight minutes to reach our eyes. At the same time, stars that were hundreds of light years distant, a beautiful band across the sky, the so-called Milky Way, which we now recognize as being itself composed of millions of stars, too dim to be seen with our eye, but all combining to form this lustry white pattern, thousands of light years from us. And then two other patches visible above the tail of the comet, themselves entire galaxies, hundreds of thousands of light years distance. In one view, it is possible to see in the sky objects separated by 10 orders of magnitude, 10 billion in distance. Views like this raise such questions as have been explored in literature. 
One of my favorite authors was the American novelist Mark Twain. In his book, Huckleberry Finn, Huck Finn wrote, we had the sky up there, all speckled with stars, and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. That's a wonderful thing to discuss. A century ago, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble began studying the universe, a view like that, to understand whether the stars was made or only just was. He used a great telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory in Southern California. On the right, you see Hubble seated at the back of the telescope. He's not recording the image with his own eye. Rather, he's steering the telescope to make fine adjustments so that it will main, remain pointed at an astronomical object while its light is recorded on photographic emulsion, the old-fashioned way that we took images a century ago. At the left, you can see this enormous structure. What's important about it is the diameter of the tube. That says how much light is collected by the telescope. The diameter was 100 inches, or not quite 2.5 meters. And that telescope made many fabulous discoveries in the 20th century. In the 21st century, and at the end of the 20th century, a telescope of about the same size was placed into orbit around the Earth by the Space Shuttle. And this telescope was named in honor of Edwin Hubble. It has the same collecting area as the Mount Wilson telescope, but several key advantages compared with it. One is that instead of using photographic material, modern electronic detectors about 50 times more sensitive were used. Another advantage is that this telescope was above the Earth's atmosphere. You can see the blurry atmosphere in the background of this image, the actual photograph taken from space. And that atmosphere distorts the images of stars. When we look up at night and see the beautiful twinkling of the stars, that actually interferes with the scientific measurements. And so being above the atmosphere is a great advantage. But there's a third advantage the Hubble telescope has. It can see colors of light that do not pass through the atmosphere, extending our range of, of sight into the infrared and ultraviolet regions of our electromagnetic spectrum. For all these reasons, the Hubble telescope has been a powerful observatory in space, bringing us many new discoveries and many beautiful images, as I will show. This is an older photograph, not a Hubble image, of a cloud of gas in the Orion Nebula. Maybe some of you know this constellation, Orion the Hunter with the belt of stars. The pink gas, the pink layer above, is actually glowing hydrogen gas in our galaxy, illuminated and made fluorescent by bright stars. At the bottom is a cloud illuminated by a star that's forming inside it. And in the middle, there's this curious silhouette. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. And it is an obscuring cloud, smoke from past generations of stars that blew into this wondrous pattern and blocked the light from behind. This is how the object looks in the optical to our eyes. The Hubble Space Telescope has taken a picture of this same Horsehead Nebula in the infrared. And this radiation can pass through the Horsehead Nebula and show something entirely new. You may not even recognize it. This billowing cloud of gas is the same viewed in infrared as the dark nebula before. You can, in fact, see the top of the horse head with the bright star just to the top left of center. And it looks like a cloud on the Earth in the sky. This is a cloud of gas and dust, of smoke, of pollution that has become dense through gravity attracting itself. And from this cloud, new stars are being born including some of those lights you see inside of the cloud. 
This image was also taken by the Hubble telescope, and it shows a star not at the beginning of its life, but its end. This amazing cloud of gas shows layers, shock waves, and shells of gas passing through interstellar space as the star has approached the end of its life and begins violent coughing and hiccuping, expelling its outer layers before the star makes its last shining moments. It's called the Cat's Eye Nebula because of the remarkable appearance of this gas cloud photographed by Hubble. And I have a few more beautiful pictures. We'll move out in distance, away from our place in the universe. Now we're at 3,000 light years. Our galaxy is about 30,000 light years across. So let's see what we come to next in Hubble's famous directory. Well, now we come to a distance outside our galaxy in one of the clouds of Magellan that was visible in my opening slide. This reddish wisp is an expanding cloud of gas, the outer layers of a star that exploded in a violent supernova event about 400 years ago. Now, we have no recording at the time to say with certainty when it happened, but we can follow the motions of this expanding shell of debris. It's the aftermath of an explosion. It's 23 light years across now, and it's expanding at many miles per second and we calculate that it began, the explosion occurred about 400 years ago. And in this cloud are elements of silicon, carbon, sulfur, iron, elements of life, elements of which we are made, born in stars, perhaps one day to form life in this galaxy. Going still further, a distance now of more than 100 times as far, we come to a beautiful galaxy, a barred spiral galaxy, which we think looks somewhat like our own Milky Way galaxy, if only we could go outside our galaxy and look at it from that vantage point. This is billions of stars. There are clouds of gas. You can see some dark lanes, which are similar to that horsehead nebula in being composed of smoke and dust that blocks the starlight behind. Those are the places where new stars can be born. Galaxies like to cluster together, just like people do. And there are places in the universe where the galaxies are so close and come together so intimately that they exchange or join together, like the pair at the bottom. In fact, this almost looks like a single galaxy, but it's two. And they're also interacting with this third galaxy, which has a very strange shape. The gravitational tug of war between those galaxies has distorted and pulled them into new shapes. This one called Stefan's Quintent of Galaxies, almost 300 million light years away. But galaxies come not only in groups of a few, they come in groups of hundreds, called clusters of galaxies. This one, three and a half billion light years away, is so far away that it's very hard to get a clear view from a ground-based telescope. And Hubble has greatly improved our understanding of this. Every object in this picture is itself a galaxy containing billions of stars, very far, very far away from our own. You see some of them are whitish in color, and they're oval-shaped or round. There are a few of those spiral galaxies visible. And then there's some very strange, strange shaped and colored blue objects. I'll say more about them later, but those also are galaxies. Still further, six billion light years distant, a good fraction of all the distance we can see in the universe, is another cluster of galaxies called Abel 370, named after American astronomer George Abel, who classified clusters of galaxies like these in the 1950s through the 1980s. This cluster has some very bizarre shaped galaxies. You see one and wonder, what is that? When astronomers analyze the light, they find that it has the same light as a galaxy, but its shape is very different. Has that been pulled into a strange pattern by the force of gravity? 
or is something else going on? This galaxy cluster also contains some of the blue objects seen in the previous one. They're a little hard to see on the screen here, but you can see maybe just faintly on this photograph some bluish streaks, which themselves are galaxies. And finally, if we look to the limits of Hubble Space Telescope's visibility, we see the deepest image that it has taken the longest exposure of light in the universe, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which contains in it two stars in our Milky Way galaxy and thousands of galaxies far outside our own, going back as far as 13 billion light years in distance. Can anyone guess which are the two stars in our galaxy? They're shaped like crosses. And the reason is that the light passing through the telescope has to go through a cross pattern which holds a mirror in place. And a, a phenomenon of light occurs called diffraction, which takes the light of a point-like or small object and spreads it into this strange pattern. For an extended or spread out image, like a galaxy, those spikes are washed out. They're uh, diffused and invisible in the image. So of all, all the things in this photograph, nearly every one of them is a galaxy containing billions of stars. And to think, our own galaxy has billions of stars. The universe is a remarkable place. Now, all that I've shown you was visible. Some of it happened to be infrared light recorded by Hubble, but it still it was light. And we ask, are there invisible things in the universe, and can we somehow see them? And to make the question more precise, I will ask, can we see things that emit no signals at all? Now, if you think about it, that horsehead nebula at the beginning, in the visible light, it was blocking the light of the background. So the answer you should give to this question is, yes, we can see things if they block the light coming from behind them in silhouette. But now I want to ask you a harder question. Can we see things that do not block light and are transparent to light? You're shaking your head yes. You have an idea. <laughs> if you have a system for detecting invisible objects, you might make a lot of money by patenting, patenting some process. You might become famous by publishing a paper. Or people may just think you're crazy. <laughs> or perhaps, or perhaps you will be part of a team that wins an Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? Raise your hands. Ah, wonderful. For those who haven't, go see it. <laughs> a physicist helped to create the images. And for those who have seen it, do you recognize this? It looks a bit like Saturn, and Saturn does play a role in the movie, but this is not Saturn. Does anyone remember what this is? It's a black hole, but I thought black holes are invisible. <laughs> By definition, a black hole is an object that emits no light and absorbs all the light incident upon it. In fact, as we'll see, a black hole cannot even block light. So what is happening? Well, you're quite right that it's a black hole, and an astronomer looking at such an image could tell you why it's a black hole. Here's why. What you're seeing is not light from the black hole itself, but light from a disk of gas, glowing gas, orbiting the black hole called an accretion disk. Here's a little cartoon of how it works. The black hole is black. Well, I don't know what other color to draw it. <laughs> and the gravity of that black hole is so strong that light can be deflected or bent gravitationally around the black hole so that light coming from the accretion disk behind 
can take a path either above or below the black hole and arrive at our camera. Of course, if the light is emitted too close to the black hole, then it will never reach our camera because it will be inside the black hole, and we know that inside the black hole, nothing emitted can reach the outside. But now, this suggests that looking at the black hole, we should see a portion of the accretion disk behind the black hole when we look up and when we look down below the equator of the black hole. Ah, that is what this is. This is the accretion disk behind the black hole, and this is also an, a second image of the accretion disk behind the black hole. This is the accretion disk in front of the black hole. So invisible, obje invisible objects can be revealed, if not directly seen, by their effects of gravity. It turns out that not only black holes deflect light, but everything that has matter deflects light a little bit. And things which have a great concentration of matter deflect light more. And this suggests that what we view in space may be distorted by the gravitational deflection of light produced by matter itself, whether it's black holes or these galaxies. Imagine that we have a background, a distant galaxy, and in front of it, there is a cluster of galaxies like the one I showed you with many galaxies, including a giant one, and here we are at Earth. Just like I showed with the black hole, light from, in this case, not an accretion disk, but from the distant galaxy, can be emitted in many directions, and just possibly light from more than one direction will be deflected by the intervening mass, the gravity of that mass, to arrive at the Earth. That would produce multiple images of the background galaxies, just as we saw two images of the accretion disk around the black hole. By the way, nobody has ever yet seen an image like that one in the movie Interstellar. That was a theoretical calculation. But what I'm showing you now, we have seen, and it reveals the same phenomenon. In fact, we can deduce where the mass must be and how much mass there must be to cause those distorted images. Remember that oddly shaped galaxy? It turns out to be a perfectly normal round galaxy whose light has been spread in this remarkable pattern by two clouds of dark matter or of invisible matter which have been put in blue. This is false color. It is a representation of where mass should be to produce the, the, the distortions of galaxies viewed in this cluster. So by analyzing the light from the cluster, we have revealed the presence of invisible mass and displayed it graphically in this superposed picture. This is from an article published earlier this year in Science Magazine. It's one of the most remarkable images of our understanding of the sky. What this image and others like it have taught us is that most of the matter in the universe is, like that blue substance, invisible. All the galaxies, all the gas, all the stars that we see are a minority. They, may, they, they make up very little of the total mass in the universe. 16% to be precise. There's five times, more than five times as much of something else which places itself differently than atoms do. 84% is of an unknown form. It's invisible. We don't know what it is. We have theories about it, and our leading theory is that this has a a new particle of nature that has not yet been discovered in laboratories on Earth. But there are efforts to discover such particle underway now across the world. Many scientists are searching, hoping to create or produce or observe this particle in their laboratories. In fact, if this theory is right, there are dark matter particles now, here, in this room, 
flying through space. They're responsible for much of the gravity of our own galaxy. One may be passing through you in that last sentence. Although we don't know what this substance is and we have no proof of holding it in our hands or detecting it directly in the laboratory, we have confidence in its existence and we give it a name. A name does not imply an understanding. The name we call it is dark matter. Now, the real understanding of any physical theory is when it makes predictions that can be tested for new phenomena. And one of the reasons we have so much confidence about this dark matter is that it can explain many other observations. The first one, actually, the original motivation, came from measurements of galaxies, these beautiful pinwheels, patterns of stars in the sky, and the motions of stars within those galaxies done in the 1970s and 1980s by Vera Rubin uh, in uh, the Carnegie Institution and her collaborators. And what she found was the stars in those galaxies did not have enough mass to keep the whole galaxy together, to hold it together against its motions. The galaxy should have flown apart. That was called the missing matter problem for a long time with galaxies. Astronomers were trying to find where is the missing matter that holds galaxies together. And eventually the, the evidence became so great that uh, we realized it must be a, a, a new form of matter undiscovered on Earth, which we, as I say, call dark matter. Another one a consequence is that galaxies themselves were formed in, with both dark matter and the atomic matter, which is here called gas. This is from an early computer simulation about 15 years uh, ago by Matthias Steinmetz, a cosmologist uh, who did these calculations uh, when he was in the University of uh, Arizona. I'll just uh, repeat it there. And gravity acts on both gas and dark matter, but atoms have additional behavior. They, uh, they interact with each other uh, to emit radiation, to uh, form gases and fluids and liquids and so forth. And so the details are a little different and it's, it's hard to see. You can probably just see the motion and maybe a little bit of the spiral pattern that appears in, in the gas. But already, already 30 years ago, cosmologists understood that this new substance, dark matter, was important in the formation of galaxies and we could not get galaxies like those we see in the universe today without it. Finally, some very precise measurements have been made about another phenomenon called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And while I won't have time to explain this in, in detail, there is a, a spacecraft launched uh, by the Europeans, the European Space Agency called the Planck Surveyor that has been mapping microwave radiation in space left over from the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. And there are some patterns of the polarization of that microwave radiation, which show remarkable detail in this plot, which is called a spectrum of the radiation. And the points are the measurements from the spacecraft. The line is a model with dark matter. In fact, the fit is so good that we can measure very precisely the amount of dark matter in the universe, even though we don't know what it is. Here's a picture of that, of that spacecraft. It was launched later than Hubble. You remember Hubble was launched in 1990 and just celebrated its 25th anniversary. This spacecraft has celebrate, is celebrating its sixth anniversary this year, but it too has made wonderful discoveries, not using visible light, but using microwaves. There is, however, one cosmic mystery that dark matter cannot explain, at least we think it cannot explain, and this has been the subject of much speculation over the past 20 years, and a Nobel Prize. <laughs> the Nobel Prize in 2011 was awarded to astronomers Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. And I'm very proud of these astronomers, in particular this one, because I taught this young man quantum mechanics at MIT. He was a very good student, a wonderful, a wonderful astronomer. And what 
these uh, colleagues and, and many others who worked on large teams found is that although our universe is expanding, the galaxies are rushing away from one another, it's doing so in a very surprising way. We understand that, galaxy, that gravity wants to pull objects together. If I toss up my laser pointer, which I'm not going to do, it will be pulled back down by the gravity of the Earth. How strange would it be when I toss this up if instead of gravity pulling it down, it was pushed away? That seems to be happening on distances of billions of light years in our universe. Distant galaxies are rushing apart from each other at increasing speeds. That's what we mean by cosmic acceleration. We don't know what is causing it, but the observation is secure enough to have warranted a Nobel Prize four years ago. We do give a name to the phenomenon we do not understand. This is common in astronomy and physics. We call that name dark energy. Well, it doesn't really explain much. But it does allow us to make plots like this, uh, a pie chart showing how much of the universe is composed of different substances. And the very humbling fact about this diagram is that the atoms of which we are composed, indeed, the elementary particles that we produce in our laboratories, all the things we know about on Earth comprise less than 5% of all there is in the universe. I said already that more than five times was in the dark matter, but what I didn't say before was even the dark matter itself is just over one quarter of all the matter and energy in the universe. There's this very exotic substance we don't understand, but we give it a name called dark energy. And just to say a little bit more about that, the dark matter is the invisible matter. It is a real substance. We're convinced that it deflects light. We understand it plays a role in galaxy formation. It's concentrated in galaxies. It plays a role in their formation. And it, it has attractive gravity of the kind we expect. Dark energy is something very different. It has repulsive gravity and is spread through space in a very different pattern. In fact, a leading theory is that the dark, en that the dark energy is associated with empty space as an intimate property of space itself called vacuum energy. That's only one theory. We have no proof of it. Physicists and astronomers are working hard to establish the nature of this substance. And since I began my lecture with a quote from literature, now it would be appropriate to quote Hamlet speaking to his assistant Horatio. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. A humbling message to physicists <laughs> from Shakespeare four centuries ago. What's even more humbling as scientists is that sometimes we make discoveries that just aren't so. A year ago, your visiting physicist, Scott Dodelson, told about a remarkable discovery made with a microwave telescope at the South Pole called BICEP2. It was said to be a spectacular confirmation of gravitational waves from the Big Bang, confirming a theory of the early universe called cosmic inflation. I don't know if any of you attended that lecture, but I watched the recording, and I was very struck by the video from YouTube of the student, the postdoc who made the discovery, speaking to the senior professor who had predicted this more than 30 years ago. And that senior professor was awestruck. He was also very cautious. He said, can it be true? <laughs> We've been fooled so many times before. <laughs> I want it to be true. When the team came out with their discovery, they made these beautiful images explaining how their observations showed confirmation of the Big Bang Theory. And well, there's, there's too much detail here, but the Big Bang on this timeline occurred, followed very quickly by a period of rapid, very rapid expansion called cosmic inflation. Quantum fluctuations in that vacuum, if I spoke of, 
produced some gravitational waves. We think that happened. The question is not what we think. The question is what have we observed? And the astronomers did see a pattern of clustering in the light of the microwave background, which was suggestive of these gravitational waves. But as scientists, we must always be skeptical, critical, and careful in our analysis of our data and the conclusions we draw. Scientific results are testable and falsifiable. And this result was too good to be true, at least for Professor Andre Linde of Stanford University and Professor Alan Guth of MIT, the theorist who came up with the idea 30 years ago. The Planck Surveyor spacecraft found that it was not the light from the Big Bang that had these correlations imprinted, but rather obscuring dust in our own Milky Way galaxy that was responsible for the appearance of these gravity waves. They were actually not gravity waves at all. And so Professor Linde was very sad. I'm very sad. It would have been nice had this confirmation been true and we could go on to make other discoveries. But it's not ours to choose. Nature gives us clues. We investigate them. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. To conclude my lecture, telescopes on the ground but also in space over the last 25 years have made great discoveries about the universe. They have revealed the invisible. We now know that most of the matter in the universe is in an invisible form, important for the formation of galaxies, and present, we think, in every galaxy. 95% of the universe is invisible, but was revealed through its gravitational effects. Even the dark energy, which causes the accelerated expansion of the uni universe, has been revealed by its gravitational effects on causing this cosmic acceleration. To humble us, we must always remember that we occupy no special place in the universe. That's Copernicus from more than four centuries ago. We are not even made of the same substance as most matter in the universe. We have remaining mysteries to explore, the expansion of the universe, its increasing pace, and of course, those never-ending questions, how will it end and how did it begin? Today's discoveries can become tomorrow's failures. Last year's discovery was falsified this year. But that's good for science, that it's, testifiable and, that it's testable and falsifiable so that we will always be humble in our pursuit of the truth and be willing to accept and correct our errors and learn in the process. And finally, those telescopes in space promise many new exciting discoveries. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Wonderful question. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, a, a black hole is enormously massive and it pulls things into it. Yet in the movie, a spacecraft entered the black hole and then escaped. How is that possible? <laughs> uh, well, the, the, first, the first thing is to uh, emphasize what you said, that a, an object, according to our understanding of gravity, once it crosses through a layer called the event horizon, cannot escape again, it is trapped. But a black hole does not reach out with hands and pull everything around it. You can get quite close to the black hole and be very safe. Just don't cross that event horizon. Now, in the movie Interstellar, the astronauts speculated about this, in fact. 
uh, because you, well, I don't know how much of the plot I should give away to those who haven't seen the movie. <laughs> but I will say that there was perhaps some artistic license in the movie and also an appeal to our, our lack of understanding about what happens in the very center of the black hole, the so-called singularity. The laws of physics as we understand them break down and we need new laws of physics, so-called quantum theories of gravity, to describe what happens in the interior of the black hole. There's really no agreement about that. And so one, by some stretch of imagination, might imagine ways that an astronaut could escape out of the black hole, but I think it was a bit of a stretch. Yes. I take, if I take a balloon and if I blow into it, it will expand because there's space around it. How does the universe expand? Ah, <laughs> a wonderful question. There's, there's no ignorant question, only ignorant answers. <laughs> um, a balloon expands, of course, by having the two-dimensional surface of the balloon expand into the third dimension propelled by the air inside of its interior. Can you imagine a balloon that existed only in two dimensions? with no third dimension? It's hard, but mathematicians can. A sphere, the surface, the sphere itself, is two dimensions. You can embed the sphere in three dimensions, but it's possible to imagine and calculate and ask what happens for a two-dimensional sphere, which expands or exists in nothing but itself. Likewise, our universe has three dimensions of space, at least, I should say because there are some who speculate there may be additional dimensions which are very hard to find. But those three dimensions, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, need not be like the flat dimensions of Euclid. They might, in fact, be curled up on themselves similarly to the two dimensions of a sphere. Imagine taking a big flat sheet of paper, cutting it into a circular shape, and folding it down to make a sphere. Well, you'd have to, the paper would cross itself, you'd, you'd have some slight difficulties in getting a good match. But at least you can conceive of the process. So, with the three dimensions of space, you might, if you stretch your mind enough, think about bending them so that they could close on themselves. Then you would have the three-dimensional analog of a two-dimensional balloon. And just like that balloon can expand, in theory, even if it has nothing it's expanding into, those three dimensions of space can expand even if they are expanding into nothing but themselves. I suspect that your university has some mathematicians who are teaching uh, geometry or differential geometry and it might be interesting to have a dialogue with them or with some of the physicists who are working in this as well. So Einstein's theory makes, makes the remarkable prediction that space can bend and curve and uh, exist in ways that we cannot conceive. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, lots of people have this question in mind. I'm not asking it be, be, because I, I can think that there is an answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What, what was uh, before uh, the Big Bang? You know St. Augustine's question, answer to that question. <laughs> well, I won't recite it here, but this, of course, is, is one, of the, one of the questions for the ages. It's remarkable that physicists attempt to answer that question. Um, I'm not sure whether it is with humility or arrogance that we attempt to do so. Um, what I will say is that, uh, philosophically, um, physics tends to uh, address rather simple problems of nature. Uh, for example, the universe is rather simple because it can be described by a mathematical theory that fits on one line, Einstein's equations. The beginning of the universe requires more. It requires an understanding of quantum mechanics and a marriage of quantum mechanics and gravity for which there exists no theory. Besides that, many of us think that very complicated processes might have taken place in those earliest instances. In fact, motivated by some ideas of quantum mechanics. And in such settings, 
physics is not always an effective tool. So I don't know what happened before the Big Bang, and I'm not sure even that that question can be uniquely posed with physics as we understand it today. Yes. That, that's an excellent question. The, the question is, uh, time itself is, can be so distorted and perhaps even has no meaning um, before the Big Bang. If there's no time, then how can we talk about before? And it's, it's not merely a Zen koan, a problem of Zen Buddhism. Uh, the physicist Stephen Hawking has created in his mind and in mathematics, a model of the universe where time closes upon itself in a similar way that a circle closes upon itself from a line. We don't know what the real description of the beginning is. There is speculation, and some uh, promising speculation, but I am one of the physicists who prefers to look for empirical evidence to guide our speculations, and so I, I, will, not, uh, uh, I will not venture far into speculating about what happened before the Big Bang. Yes. Is it your opinion that uh, singularities are like beginning of the universe or black holes can be understood only by having quantum gravity? Without having quantum gravity, we cannot have full understanding of these issues, only speculate. Yeah, great question. How much do we have to understand about quantum gravity to understand the beginning of the universe, black holes, and so on? For the beginning of the universe, I believe we probably do need to understand far more about quantum gravity than, than we do now, which is next to nothing. For black holes, there is some debate among uh, the physicists working on black holes. There is a, a group of physicists called string theorists, many of whom believe that they have the beginnings of understanding about quantum behavior inside black holes, and they make some predictions about what happens just inside of the event horizon of a black hole. Some of you may have seen in the popular press or in science magazines uh, something called the firewall, an idea that perhaps just below the event horizon of a black hole there's some incredible surface where space is just destroyed and anything that passes through it. Many of us are skeptical about that. Uh, while it does have some, the idea has some motivation from string theory, there is no empirical evidence to support it. It is a, a, a theoretical uh, construct, and it's dependent on assumptions of string theory and about string theory, which are uh, not yet tested or confirmed. Um, I think there's some role of philosophy in the way we do science and in the way we do physics. Um, there are radicals who construct new theories well ahead of their time. Many of those theories are doomed to fail, um, but it's worth constructing those theories and trying. There are conservatives who want to use the existing theory even when uh, it's perhaps outlived its usefulness and we're no longer sure that it's valid. Somewhere in between, we have to find the middle road, and we haven't found that middle road yet for black holes. Ah, beautiful question. So to restate, when we look at distant objects, we're seeing them as they were in the past. And so, could we see far enough to see things at the beginning? In fact, that was the great excitement about last year's near discovery of the fluctuations from immediately after the Big Bang. The thought was there was, a, there was an indirect measurement of gravitational waves produced a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. 
That would have been very close to the beginning. As you've heard, that observation has not been confirmed. It's been falsified. There, we have indirect evidence going back to about one second after the Big Bang uh, from uh, neutrinos and elementary particles in the universe which were created in that time. We have quite direct evidence going back 400,000 years after the beginning of the Big Bang through the cosmic microwave background radiation. But we are mystery hunters who have puzzle to solve in physics and we take many clues which don't seem to fit together and we look how to put them together to form a complete picture of our puzzle of the universe. And perhaps by following this strategy, one day we will get very close to the beginning. Maybe even we'll get beyond. <laughs> yes? Uh, if I understand you correctly, the dark energy is a different type of gravitation which uh, doesn't pull but pushes. Yes. So what would be the impact of that? Uh, for example, in the pitch, uh, the schematic that you show us, light goes and then bends over and it bends too much and it comes right to the source. So if, if I pull that out, then what would happen? Ah. Uh, so dark energy is some exotic substance which, pulls, which pushes rather than pulls. And so what would its effect be on the deflection of light? Well, a couple of things. Um, First of all, the deflection of light is caused by what are called gradients or variations uh, in the gravity. It turns out that, the, that the, at least the vacuum energy form of dark energy, so we don't know with, with assurance, but we think that the, that the dark energy has little or no gradient, and so it would not have any effect on deflecting of light that would distort the background images. On the other hand, it does have an effect in pushing things uniformly apart. Now, you might then ask, why haven't we seen evidence for this on Earth? Well, the answer is that the effect is extremely weak. In the solar system, even going out from the sun to the farthest planet, Neptune, the attractive gravity of the sun is more than 100 orders of magnitude stronger than the repulsive force of dark energy. So there's no hope of seeing this within our solar system, nor within our Milky Way galaxy, nor within our cluster of galaxies, and it's not until we look at galaxies billions of light years away that we can see evidence for this pushing apart. Uh, here, yes, sir. The dark energy is the pushing everything. So is, is it possible something like a black hole consists of dark energy? That a black hole consists of dark energy? But uh, similar to the lack of uh, dark energy uh, than high density. Well, not exactly dark energy because, as, I've, as I said, our, our limited understanding of dark energy suggests that it's the same everywhere, and so it cannot be concentrated. In fact, that's a key empirical observation about the dark energy. This, this pushing apart is the same in all directions and in all places in the universe as best we can determine. So it cannot be concentrated into places. It is possible there are other forms of matter waiting to be discovered besides the dark matter and this dark energy, which have unusual properties. But until we find them, we can only speculate, and I won't speculate very much. All right, yes, first this gentleman, and then we'll come to the other side. Um, I recently came across a um, uh, research conducted by um, Harvard postdoc students, one of them a friend in the Department of Astronomy that uh, claimed to have uh, detected gamma ray radiation coming from the center of the galaxy right. that might be constituted by dark matter annihilation. Right. Um, I was wondering if you've been in, uh, aware of, or if you've been involved in uh, such uh, research right. and if you think a research of such could provide an uh, understanding of what dark matter is. Uh, yes, there is a, there is a group at, uh, led by astronomers at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics that have analyzed gamma radiation from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, gamma radiation, like X-rays, uh, do not penetrate well through our Earth's atmosphere. And so these have been observed using orbiting telescopes looking at still different wavelengths of light. 
And uh, indeed, there, there does seem to be a, a hint, maybe even a strong hint, of uh, some excess radiation coming from the center of the galaxy that could be due to dark matter particles colliding with themselves and turning into pure energy in the form of gamma rays. That's speculative, but that I will, I will go so far as to acknowledge that's a very useful speculation uh, because there is a testable model, there's a fit with data. Um, I'd say the results are, are tentative, they're not fully convincing, but they do suggest additional measurements uh, which might reveal that the dark matter is not completely invisible, but at least can annihilate itself to produce things that are visible. That would be wonderful if true, and so astronomers are very excitedly looking forward to more evidence. Yes? In the movie Interstellar, there's also the issue of time travel. Can our current understanding of physics explain that phenomenon? Yes, actually, the discussion of time travel in the movie Interstellar was done very carefully. And no surprise, because the technical editor to the movie was Kip Thorne, who is uh, perhaps the world's greatest living uh, general relativist and, and a great master of our understanding of time travel. Um, so yes, there was an object called a wormhole, a bridge between two distant uh, regions of space that was uh, introduced in the movie as a device for uh, creating some time travel possibilities. Um, there were some other remarkable phenomena, such as if you're very close to the black hole, one of the planets that was orbiting close to the black hole, uh, a day on that planet was how many years? A, a long time. Uh, there was so a change in the rate at which we live and at, at which clocks tick caused by, by gravity. So yes, those parts of the movie were, were quite accurate and uh, believable if we had the technology and if there existed a wormhole. <laughs> Nolan's idea of black holes creating universes. Now, Lee Smolin is a, a Canadian um, astrophysicist who has uh, worked a lot on the boundary between string theory and relativity. And uh, he and others have speculated that our universe and others like it might have come from quantum fluctuations um, occurring in, in many different uh, settings. I'm not knowledgeable about the details of his theory, so I, I don't want to, um, uh, to state what I haven't uh, studied carefully, but uh, the idea that quantum fluctuations can produce uh, expanding regions of space-time, that is fairly well established. That's a branch of quantum theory and quantum mechanics of gravity that's understood better than what happens at singularities, and it is very plausible that uh, even, even our universe might have started that way, but we're not sure. Yes, uh, in the middle. Uh, my question is about a documentary I recently watched. Uh, it's called Into the Universe with Stephen Hawking. I don't know, maybe you've seen it. Uh, in there, Stephen Hawking uses a marble analogy for explaining uh, how everything uh, existed. Uh, in his analogy, he fills the floor of his room with marbles and everything is perfect order. There is no wind. Uh, uh, every one of them is in the same distance from each other. There is just orderness and organization, but there are no uh, external forces. Uh, but uh, he states that if everything is perfect, there will be any existence of matter or uh, energy or anything else. Uh, and he takes up uh, five marbles from there, uh, and that causes some gravitational uh, uh, clusters uh, occurring in there. Uh, I wonder uh, what causes this uh, disorders or fluctuation in gravity, or what causes this first. Uh, external uh, effects on do those order stuff. It's a, I haven't seen that uh, particular episode of Stephen Hawking's uh, universe, but I understand your description, his use of metaphor in having a perfectly ordered arrangement of, for example, marbles on a floor. 
being uninteresting and unable to produce uh, the complex structure that we see in the universe. Something must disturb that order to create the lovely chaos that we have in our world. And that is where, let me, let me go back to um, a picture from the Planck uh, spacecraft. That's actually relevant to this, in, this uh, data set that was collected by this spacecraft. One thing we do understand uh, pretty well about uh, quantum mechanics is that uh, ordinary matter, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, behaves partly as a wave and, and sometimes as a particle. And in choosing between wave and particle, uh, these uh, objects of nature fluctuate. Uh, this uh, quantum fluctuations of matter have been understood for many, many decades, uh, measured in the laboratory. Um, in fact, they underlie uh, the basis of quantum mechanics going back a full century. So we understand that uh, particles and fields in the early universe would also undergo these fluctuations and would naturally produce some kind of um, uh, irregularities in the patterns present in the early universe. If we assume that the universe began almost completely smooth, but with the minimal degree of fluctuations required by the laws of quantum mechanics, we can then calculate what happens as the universe expands and gravity acts on all of the substances in the universe. The result is this remarkable agreement between the theory and the observation, and indeed, a remarkably accurate theory for the formation of galaxies themselves. That's a great triumph of modern physics, uh, but it is only the partial answer to your question about the ultimate origins, not only of the fields that fill the universe, but of the universe itself. And so uh, I will leave you with that question to ponder, hoping that some of you will help us physicists to bring order to our disorder, to help us remove the chaos from the universe and explore with us the causes of the universe and its existence. For that, I think your next speaker will be a philosopher. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.